Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig, it's 12 o'clock on a Sunday, which means it's time for a Q&A. Now this is where I take all the questions that you've asked over the course of the week and I try to answer them to the best of my ability. I've been away for the last week and a half. First of all, I was in Columbus at the Penguin uh, Studios at the P3 Magic Theatre, filming a bunch of stuff for them. Then I went over to Magic Live and I was uh, you know, doing the whole Magic Live thing, including demonstrating on the Penguin stand, which was super fun. So uh, yeah, anybody that I met at Magic Live, anybody that I met at Columbus, hello. I hope you guys uh, had a good time. I had an absolute blast. I'm going to be doing a few videos about Magic Live over the coming few days. Um, but yeah, we're going to get straight into the Q&A this week. Uh, before I start the Q&A, I will be doing videos on this in the future. Uh, but this is, I, I, this is Friday evening. I've literally just spent 24 hours traveling back. And uh, this is Friday evening. Uh, and uh, Britain's Got Talent have put Ryland's performance up on their YouTube channel. And uh, there's lots of people that have said amazing things. I will be discussing this more at some point in the future. But just for everybody who said really nice things about Ryland's act, I really appreciate it. He's super excited. He had an absolute blast. So thank you very much for everyone that watched that. But without further ado, uh, we're going to get straight into this week's Q&A. So let's do it. Right, so the first question is from a Disco Dalek. And Disco Dalek says, Deck Switches. What are good resources to learn a deck switch? Would be good to hear your thoughts on the spectrum of gimmicked, ungimmicked, standing, sitting, close-up, parlor and stage switches, encompassing advanced sleight of hand as well as a beginner level as well as pros and cons. Do you have a top five, possibly a suitable topic for another video? Yeah, I did a, uh, I did, I did a small section on this about a year ago on a 5x5. Five five. Uh, but it's something that I could definitely expand on, like the best deck switches of all time. Um, the, what I will tell you is the best resource to get is a book by Roberto Jobby. And it's called, uh, I think it's called The Art of Deck Switching. And it's got multiple deck switches in there, like an absolute ton of deck switches. That's something well worth looking at. My favourite deck switch is the cooler. I remember when I first watched... Uh, Christian, is it Christian Nimbloom, uh, performed the cooler, uh, which was at an international, it was probably international magic, it was Ron's Day, it was one of the last Ron's Days, and I remember watching him perform it there for the first time, and I was with David Penn, and we just looked at each other, mouth open, it was an incredible deck switch, it's still an incredible deck switch, um, yeah, it's mechanical, but it absolutely does the job and then some. And myself and Ryland did review it on the review show at some point in the past, but it was probably over a year ago. Um, my favourite way of switching a deck, really, to be honest, is just uh, by doing a pocket switch. So, you know, if I've got a deck of cards here, uh, go, having a reason to go into the pocket to get something out... And as I go into the pocket to get something out and my hands are searching for that thing, I come out with the thing and then I've switched the deck. Now, you've probably seen me do this a couple of different times. I used it on the Quantum deck. If you look at my stage performance, if you've got the Quantum deck and you look at my stage performance, uh, I think it's called Wipeout in the performance section, you'll see me on stage in front of like, I think about 100 people. It's not that much, about 50 people in smoke and mirrors. And I just switch the deck openly in front of the audience as I'm looking for a rubber band. And nobody ever notices, especially if you do a body turn, so they don't really see what's going on. Uh, I also used it on my Penguin Live when I was doing the forecast routine. Um, and I also used it on the forecast project. So I use, you'll see me use that deck switch quite a lot. For me, uh, it's the most natural deck switch. Yeah, you have to have a justification to go into your pocket, but if you can come up with that justification, in all honesty, I think that's the best way to switch a deck. Um, having said that, there are lots of things out there, um, and yeah, I'll do a video on it, absolutely not a problem, but uh, Greg Wilson's deck switch, um, Christian Emblem's deck switch, The Cooler, and uh, Roberto Giobbi's uh, book, The Art of Deck Switching, all of those are well worth your time. So the next question is from Caleb Lang, and Caleb says, is Venom Cube a one-trick pony, or are there other applications for this gimmick? Love the effect, but I have a hard time continuing to pay this type of price for a single-use gimmick. Uh, look, I'm going to be honest with you. Really, there's nothing else you can do with Venom Cube other than doing a matchup of two Rubik's Cubes. Having said that, I think it is the absolute best cube matching effect that there is out there. 
Uh, and I know lots of different ways of matching cubes. You know, I do an, a Rubik's Cube 360. Since the Vanishing Ink uh, Rubik's project came out, the Rubik's Cube project, uh, I've been using that, an, uh, you know, an awful lot, uh, along with um, Rubik's 360. Uh, and, and that's great, but the problem is you've got to, you know, anybody who knows it, there's a bit of procedure with a bag and, and a gag, which you don't get with Venom Cube. If you actually think about it with Venom Cube, you give someone a cube, they mix it, you're holding the other cube from the very beginning, and then immediately you just show that the cubes match with no moves whatsoever. It is really the holy grail of matching two cubes. So yeah, it does one thing, but it does that one thing really, really well. Put it this way, if I was going to go on television, and I was going to do a cube matching effect, and I wanted it to look the best it could possibly look, I would do Venom Cube, because really there's no better way of doing it. Um, so yes, it is a one trick pony, um, but I mean, I do it in my show and it kills. It always gets a really great reaction. I know other people do it in their show. Ryland does it all the time. It gets a great reaction when Ryland does it. It's just a really good trick. Are there other ways of doing it? Yeah, you've seen tons of videos of me on this channel doing um, uh, timing solves and things like that. And, uh, you know, the RD, uh, the Rubik's Dream, especially walk around with the small cube and the shell look absolutely amazing. And there are other ways of doing it. Absolutely for sure. And Venom Cube really needs to be done. It's not a walk around piece. It really needs to be done in front of an audience. But you perform regularly in front of an audience. Venom Cube is worth its weight in gold. And sometimes I don't think it, I don't think something being a one trick pony is a negative. I think it's not a bad thing as long as uh, it does that one thing really, really well. Uh, next question is from Brandon Pierce, and Brandon says, Craig, I have to say, forecast is awesome. I'm absolutely loving the routines in it. Don't need the gimmick. Never leave home without my deck in Demonica, but it's reinvigorated my passion for the Mem deck. Oh, that's really good to hear, Brandon. Uh, I don't need the gimmick either. Uh, in all honesty with you, the three routines that use the gimmick, um, you know, the gimmick's incorporated into the routines, but they've been structured in such a way that you don't need the gimmick. Um, so as you get better with Mem decks, you don't need the gimmick. You can do it without... Um, so yeah, I've been using Memdex long enough to know that I uh, to, to know them well enough that I don't need it like you. Um, but yeah, the real goal for me in forecast is the routines. Those are the actual routines that I do in a gigging situation all of the time. So yeah, I'm really glad you like it. Thank you very much. I've had some really great feedback. Even the cafe have been nothing but nice about forecast, which is incredible. Really, <laughs> you know, it's incredible. Um, so yeah, th thank you, thank you very much. I'm really glad you liked it. Okay, so the next question is from Mark McKay, and Mark says, uh, you're giving so much to the magic community these days, but my magic bookcase is sadly lacking anything by Craig Petty, is writing a book on your bucket, bucket list. Also, I love the channel. Please try to remember H is an unfortunate side effect of the success. Please ignore them. Yes, I am. Um, yeah, books. Okay, so uh, I kind of alluded to this on a previous video a few weeks ago, but I'll, I'll tell you guys, um, I'll, I'll tell you straight up. I've been writing a book for the last two or three months, um, a big book full of routines, full of stories, um, and it's going to be published by Magic Week, um, and hopefully the goal is that it's released at Blackpool next year. That's the goal. And I want it to be more than just a collection of tricks. There's nothing wrong with a collection of tricks, but as you know from this channel, I love theory and, uh, you know, I love stories and I love learning from uh, experiences that we have, right? So one thing that I'm trying to do, as well as having a great collection of tricks, uh, the vast majority of which are completely unpublished, um, I'm also putting in there a ton of theory. Uh, and not, but uh, it, I'm basically telling a load, a load of stories about my life. So it's going to tell the story of my life through magic, but each one of these stories is a separate chapter, and each one of these stories um, basically is a lesson in either what to do or what not to do to become a professional magician. Um, so I'm trying to teach through it, sharing my experiences and interspersing that with tricks as well. So if you like listening to funny stories, perfect. If you like learning tricks, perfect. If you like um, theory, perfect. So yeah, it is coming. Uh, I'm, I'm about halfway through writing it. Um, I'm a perfectionist, so it's taking its time. And also, I'm quite busy doing a bunch of other stuff as well. But uh, yeah, the goal is Blackpool 2023. The uh, the book will launch. 
Okay, so the next question is from David W. And David says, uh, uh, I got back from a gig last weekend. It went really well, but I would say 30% of my material didn't land that well. This was my first gig in a while. How do you decide what to refine, what to cut from your set? How do you know if it's you or the trick? Uh, very good question, David. Um, really, it's there's a few different factors at play here. The first factor is just, you know, think, you know, you'll have a feeling in your gut, if you know what I mean. You'll have a feeling. If something has completely died on its ass, you'll know. Okay, you'll know. Even if the audience doesn't know, you'll know, right? Um, what I tend to do, or at least I don't do it as much these days, if I'm completely honest, but in the early days I used to do this every single time, is I would just, before I left the venue, I would write down everything that went well, and I'd write down everything that didn't go well. I'd go into, a, if I've got a green room, I'd go into a green room. If I haven't got a green room, I'd go into a sort of a separate area or even sit outside in the car. And what I'd do is I'd write it all down. I'd make notes on what went well and what didn't go well. And I'd do it there and then while it's fresh in my mind. Because if I, you know what happens if you, if you leave the venue and you get home and then you go to bed or whatever, and by the next morning, you've completely forgotten. So I'd write down what goes, what went well and what didn't go well. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll, I'll look at what didn't go well and I'll figure out why it didn't go well. Now, it might just be that it was me. It might be that it's a scripting issue. It might be that it's a routining issue. Um, but what you need to do is you need to figure it out, right? You need to figure out, and you've asked the question here, which is good. How do you decide what to refine, what to cut from the list? A lot of it is flight time. If you, you know, sometimes you have to be brutal. If there's a trick that you're putting, I, and it's happened to me, I've put tricks into my repertoire that I've learned and I've just loved the trick. I've thought it was a great trick, but it just doesn't land like I want it to. And I've tried it numerous times and it just never lands like I want it to. And so I end up just giving up on it, right? I've, I've had that so many times. Um, and, and part of it is knowing your character and part of it is knowing, um, you know, the, uh, the way that you perform. But sometimes you just have to be brutal and sometimes you have to cut stuff from the list. And if you've gone out to five or six gigs and it's just not hitting and you're trying everything, then then maybe it's a case of looking for something else, right? Um, in terms of refining it, again, when you make your list of what's worked and what's not worked, what you want to do is you want to kind of... Don't just decide if a, gig, if a trick's worked or not. Why hasn't it worked? Where were you expecting the audience to applaud and why didn't they? And it might be a scripting thing. It might just be that you need to script it a little bit better or you might need to think about the presentation a little bit more. It might be that you need to change the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the a move or something. I remember there's a trick that I do um, and I do it all of the time. And uh, it's, it's a trick with some blank cards and it's coming out on a pro it's coming out at some point on a project um, and uh, it's a killer trick I, I love performing it and I created it absolutely ages ago and when I first created it even though I really like the effect it wasn't hitting and it wasn't hitting at this one point there's this one moment where something happens basically a, a, a card prints in slow motion and uh, it's kind of like a slow motion sandwich with blank cards and there's this one moment that I was expecting a really big reaction and it didn't get a really big reaction. It got kind of more of a golf clap and it's like, oh, that's OK. And it was literally just the case that I had to change a slight round and I had to put a different slight in. The slight that I used just didn't work at that point. And it meant that I telegraphed what was happening and the audience was kind of aware of what was going to happen before it happened. So I kind of went back to it and I looked at the slides and I was like, well, how can I fix this? And, and the next time I tried it out, it got a much better reaction. So it's kind of, don't forget, don't forget that you can practice in front of friends and family. Get somebody who you can practice your material on that will be honest with you. Now, that can be a magic buddy. It could be your wife. Like Ryland has his sister. <laughs> he has the sister test, right? He shows things to Thea and she's brutal. She may not do magic, but she's been around long enough to know everything. So she's brutal. If she sees something, she'll tell him. Uh, I have the wife test, but I also try all my stuff out on Lloyd Barnes and Nemed Phoenix and people like that. So have a support group that you can try stuff out on rather than just going straight to the gig, because a lot of the time you'll figure this out 
in, in, in practice, right? If you actually, and what I mean by practice is giving it a full run through to a friend. But you know, a lot of the time when you perform it to a friend, you half ass it, you go, okay, I'm gonna, and you don't give it the full presentation that you would in a gigging situation. You need to get used to giving it a full performance because if you give it a full performance, then you'll, you'll realize where things need to be improved, if that kind of makes sense. And don't be afraid to video your performances as well and look back at them. But if you are going to video your performances, you need to give it a full performance as well. And you'll feel it, you'll feel it. If you give it a full performance and don't just think in your head what you're going to say, you'll realise that at times it doesn't work like it's meant to. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helps. That's the, uh, that's the best advice I can give you. Um, the most important thing is just flight time and just don't be afraid to be brutal and cut things out. Okay, so we've got another question from David W. And this question is, if I have a table that's hard work to engage, will I keep chipping away at it or do I cut my set short? Uh, it's a great question, really. Um, it depends on a couple of different factors. The main factor it will depend on is how many people there are at a venue, uh, how many people there are at the event. So, for example, I've got a gig coming up tomorrow where I've got two hours and there's like 20 people. That's it. There's 20 people in two hours. And I think there are over three tables. And uh, I'm going to have to just, I can't just skip one table or just cut one table short when I've only got three tables and I'm there for two hours. I'm going to have to just soldier on, right, and try my absolute best to win them over. Um, if there's a lot of people, if I'm trying to get around a lot of tables and I've come in, I'm like, hey, my name's Craig, I'm the magician. How are you doing? You look very excited. You, sir, you look especially excited. If they're kind of just being resistant right from the very beginning, I'll give it 100%. And if I've done my first trick and they're being kind of resilient, uh, I, I will cut it short. And, uh, you know, I, I, again, I don't have set lists per se. I used to, I don't really anymore because I know so much material. I just kind of wing what I'm going into next based on the audience in front of me. Um, but, but you know, if, if, I've, if I've performed a routine and I felt that it's, not, it's fallen a bit flat, uh, you know, and that can happen sometimes, maybe I'll try something else, but I have no problem cutting it short and just saying, well, guys, thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed that. I've got to get around every single table here. So I uh, hope you have a fantastic evening. Thank you very much. Because a lot of the time, if you think that they're disengaged, they might just be naturally introvert they might be really enjoying it i've had that i actually went to a gig a couple of times this has happened to me where i've done a bunch of tables and i did a particular table and it felt like it was a real struggle like i was wading through the tar so i kind of cut it short and afterwards when i was leaving one of the people off that table or came over to me and was like oh my god that was amazing that was the best thing ever and they just weren't natural reactors just because you think they're being they're disengaged it might be they're enjoying it, but they're actually showing it in a completely different way, uh, if you know what I mean. But, but it's, And a lot of the time, it's kind of trying to figure out what the audience is into. So, for example, if you go over to a wedding, if you're at a wedding and you go over to a group of people and they're all kind of really elderly and they're like 80 odd, uh, which can happen at weddings, and you start busting out like flourishes and sibyl cuts and stuff like that that's probably not going to land so it's about understanding and again this comes back to flight time understanding that different audiences you need different material for different audiences on different tables now i know some people are going to say to me no you can do the same thing on every table and that's fine if that works for them that's really cool but what i prefer to do is i prefer to adapt the material that i do on each table to the group of people that i'm performing to uh, you know, so if I get a vibe that they're into, like, you know, a lot of the time, yeah, and you learn this over time. So a lot of the time I go over to a table full of guys, card magic is going to work really well. They'll probably play poker or something like that. Card magic is going to work really well. If I go over to a table and there's a lot of uh, women, uh, coins across will work well. Any sort of coin material will work well, but mentalism will probably work well with them as well. You know, it's just about adapting the material and listening to your audience. So if somebody goes, oh, I love Darren Brown. I'm going to shift into more sort of mind reading stuff. Uh, it's just about reading your audience. And yeah, sometimes you do have to cut tables short. I know I have several times, but a lot of the time when you're cutting a table short, they might be enjoying it and you don't even know about it. OK, so the next question is from David Moore Magician. And David Moore says, hi, Craig, love all your videos. Thank you very much. Honest question. Do you usually mess up at least one trick when you're doing a bigger gig or function? 
I personally get at least one part of one effect wrong somewhere when performing around 20 different effects, despite practice, practicing the trick as much as humanly possible. But I always say something like, forget about it, I'll show you something better. I love giving my audience the most amazing things I can show them, but it usually involves a risk of failure. I believe the chances of failing are worth the risk of showing something new and amazing. Otherwise, I might never perform it. Um, I understand where you're coming from. I do understand where you're coming from. And I, it sounds like you're doing a stage. You're talking about a bigger gig or function and you're talking about 20 different effects. So I'm guessing that you're you're talking about stage, um, um, but tell me if I'm not, but I'm guessing you're talking about stage. Um, the thing that you need to understand, right, whether it's stage or close-up, is that the audience never know what the ultimate effect is. They don't know where you're going with it, right? They don't know what's going to happen. So you have the ability to go in a completely different direction depending on the audience. So, so for example, just before I went to America, I did a close-up job in Wales and um, I went up to this group of guys. There was a table of about 10 people, went up to a group and I was going to go into like a brief ambitious card routine before going into something else. I got them to pick a card and I did the slipstream control uh, to control it to the top, but uh, to control it second from top. Uh, and, and what the plan was, was to do a triple lift and do an Erdnage change, which would um, basically make their make an indifferent card turn into their card. But then I would be set up for a triple lift so I could put the card in the middle, have it come to the top, put the card into the middle again and have it come to the top. That was the goal, right? Now, I, I, in dissecting it afterwards, I realized what happened. Um, but basically, I did the slipstream control, controlled it second from top. Uh, but instead of doing a triple lift, I just did a quadruple lift. Uh, I did a strike. I thought it was a triple, it was a quadruple. So I turned four cards over. I did the Erdnase change. And instead of the card turning into the selected card, it turned into a, another card that was completely different to their card. Um, now, that wasn't a problem because I didn't say... You know, the, the presentation for this was, hey, pick a card, it's lost in the deck, right? I'm going to take another card. Is that your card? No, watch if I wave my hand over. It turns into the, and I normally go, it turns into your card with your signature. Isn't that amazing? I was like, it turns into a different card. How good is that? That's called sleight of hand. And, and the audience don't know what's happening. Now, I have no idea what's going on. I don't know where their card is. So I turn the quadruple over and I'm thinking, well, maybe I accidentally controlled it to the top maybe that's where it is maybe it's on top uh so i then said but if i snap my fingers now it turns into a completely different card and again it wasn't the card and i was just getting a series of color changes and i was thinking in my head well okay the only place it can be is second from top so i dropped the card face up on top and i showed it to the audience and as i did i picked up a double and i saw that their their card was there and i did a uh, a shapeshifter change by Marta souza and i had it turn into their card now that was nothing like what they were expecting it to be. That was nothing like I was expecting it to be. I was expecting to turn turn a card over, wave my hand over and have it change into their card. In reality, I waved a hand over, turned it into a different card, took the card, changed it into a different card, and eventually it turned into their card. But they didn't realise that that wasn't the effect. They didn't realise that I'd screwed up, which I had. They They just thought that the effect I was going for was a series of snappy colour changes. Um, and when I finally got their card, I just went straight into the routine from that point by doing a top change. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here, and there is a point here, is that a lot of the time the audience don't know what the effect is going to be that you're performing, right? And you say normally you tell the audience, forget about it, I'll show them something better. You shouldn't really need to do that because the, the, you, should, you should really be in a situation where if something's going wrong, you can fix it in a magical way, whatever it is. There is not a single trick that I do that goes wrong that I can't fix it and the audience isn't aware that there's been a problem. I lose a card in the deck, no problem. I'm just going to cull that card to the top and palm it and produce it from my wallet. And they think that's the trick. I accidentally mix up a Rubik's Cube when I'm doing Rubik's Cube magic. I'm going to solve it blindfolded or I'm going to go into a thing where I solve one side. Uh, there's always something that you can do to bring the trick to a successful conclusion, right? 
Um, so, and the key thing to this is to look at all of your tricks, work out how they're going to go wrong, and and figure out how you how you fix them. And I've talked about this on the channel before. I'm not going to spend much time on it now. The reason for this is because when people are in stressful situations, they don't make very good decisions. The way to make a better decision is to make the decision before the stressful situation occurs. So you think of all the different ways the trick goes wrong and you work out what you're going to do about that before it actually happens. That way, it's never going to be an issue, right? And there's also an element of thinking on your feet as well. So yeah, things go wrong in my act all the time. Things go wrong when I'm doing close-up. Things go wrong when I'm doing stage all of the time. But the audience generally aren't aware of it because I've kind of winged it and I've gone in a completely different direction that they aren't even aware of. So that's the biggest piece of advice I can give you. I hope that helps. Okay, so the next question is from Illusionist said Zeus. And the question is, I have a very specific question. Okay. Uh, what do you do with clients' telephone numbers? First, how do you save them? What do you write? What do you do with them after a show? What do you do if the client says, I'll think about it and never calls you back? Um, this is a marketing related question. Uh, and this exact answer is in the Netflix on the silver level. I've got this whole uh, video on tracking inquiries and, and what to do about it. And it goes through everything in great detail. So I'm going to break it down very, very briefly for you here. Um, but really, my advice is to sign up to the silver level of Netflix because this answer, this question and a load of other questions are answered in great detail. Basically, what you want is you want a CRM system. Uh, uh, a CRM system allows you to keep track of clients' details and search of them very, very easily and then send them emails, right? So I use a CRM system. There's lots of different CRM systems that you can use. Um, uh, the easiest and cheapest one to use is MailChimp, which can be used as a CRM system. I use something called Infusionsoft by Keep. Um, so what do I do with clients' telephone numbers? They're stored inside Infusionsoft. Then when we need a client's phone number, we just search inside Infusionsoft and we find it and we've got all of the details, including everything they've paid, including um, all of their forms that we filled in, their initial inquiry, any email correspondence we've excuse me, had with them, any emails they've had back and forth, and everything's in there. Um, but we also have spreadsheets with their phone numbers on as well. Uh, we have different spreadsheets for different parts of the customer journey. So my sales team in the sales office they have a spreadsheet and they have access to Infusionsoft with all of the kind of ongoing inquiries, all of the new inquiries, all of the people that are inquiring. And then there's another spreadsheet for people that have booked in that's used by the admin team and by the ops team so that when people are ringing up with questions with regards to their event or they're ringing up to uh, pay a balance or whatever it is, we've got their information in front of us as well. And it allows us to track and chase up balance payments for any bookings that are coming up on any, any particular time. Um, but you should get into the habit of tracking everything. So when a person inquires, uh, you need to take all of their information. You need to take all of their information. You can have it in a CRM system, you can have it on a spreadsheet, ideally you can have it in both places that have all, take all of their information, their name, their email address, their phone number, the date that they're looking for, the package they're looking for, uh, the amount that you've quoted them. And, and then what you wanna do is, in, you wanna have a column called next action. And in that next action column, you want to put down what the next action is. So when you've spoken to them, um, you want to, uh, uh, you wanna write down what the outcome is, like have they booked? Or have they not booked? And if they haven't booked, what's the reason for not booking? Or if they're thinking about it, you know, what time and date are you going to ring them back to check to see if they actually want to book it or not? All of this stuff is very, very important. You've said, what do you do with them after the show? After the show, they get sent feedback forms and they get put into an after sales thing. Um, basically, we make sure that they're opted in. And as long as they're opted in, we keep in touch with them once a month with information that they, we think they'll find useful. And that's targeted to the thing that they inquired about initially. Um, what do you do if the client says, I'll think about it and never calls back? Well, you should never leave it in the, spectator, in the client's hand. So when you get an inquiry, you need to see that through to a yes or a no. So in other words, if somebody rings up and you pitch them, if they book, great. In that next action, you write booked. Perfect. If they say no, 
perfect. You write no, and in reason why not, too expensive, or whatever it may be. If they say, I want to think about it, you go, fantastic, that's absolutely fine. Or I don't want to book right now. Okay, that's not a problem. I'll give you some time to think about it. I'll drop you an email with what we do. When would you like me to give you a call back? Oh, I'm busy until next Monday. Okay, would you like me to give you a call next Monday? What's the best time to call you next Monday? Six o'clock. Okay, I'll give you a call at six o'clock next Monday. And then, uh, you know, you can let me know if you want to book or not. Does that sound good? In the meantime, I'll send you an email. Brilliant. So then you write down in your next action, um, six o'clock Monday. Okay, and so on six o'clock on Monday, you ring them back and, uh, and, and you either get a yes and no or you, you, you know, work out what the date is that they want to give you a call back. And after three times, if somebody doesn't answer a couple of times, I'll try them. I'll try them again. If somebody doesn't answer a third time, I'll just put it as no. And uh, I'll just put reason avoiding calls because we don't like to harass people. Uh, but realistically, you should you should see it through to a yes or a no. I can't tell you the amount of magicians I've spoken to that don't track their inquiries. So an inquiry comes through and they just like go, yeah, yeah, I'm available. Yeah, okay, let me know if you're interested. And they, they, you know, they don't know how many inquiries they've had. They don't know what that person's details are. You, you know, it's been left in the client's hand. Really you want to leave it in your hands. You want, to, you want to chase it up so you get a yes, a no, or a maybe. There's a lot more I can talk about on this subject. I'm not going to. It's all in the metrics, okay? The next question is from Sam Fuller, magician. And Sam says, as always, Craig, legendary work. Hope Magic Live is awesome. Must mean Keymaster's close. Uh, you, so question, yes. Keymaster was launched at Magic Live. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, question, you're in the middle of a trick. And out the blue, they ask, I want to shuffle those. Your heart sinks. What do you do? Or the question, I want to put the card back in the deck. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear your outs or responses. Thanks, Craig. Um, okay, so first of all, if people want to shuffle the deck, they can. Uh, I have a deck of cards here. If people want to shuffle the deck of cards, they can. I, at any point, I'm very comfortable with palming, so at any point, if somebody wants to shuffle the deck, I'll uh, I'll just say, yeah, give the deck a shuffle for me. Do me a favor, though, I want to see you shuffling the cards, so shuffle them here. And as I've got the card palmed, I'll just make a shuffling action like this. And I'll act like I'm just looking at them, but I've got the card palmed here. So that as I take them back, uh, I load the card on top. And you can do that from a gambler's cop as well. So you can cop the card out and then cop it back onto the bottom of the deck. If people want to shuffle the cards, let them. Absolutely let them. Just get comfortable with palming a card or palming cards as the cards are shuffled. And then as you take them back, just load it back on top of the deck, okay? So the shuffling thing isn't a problem as long as you can palm. Uh, and if you can't palm, let me know and we'll go through some techniques on palming. In terms of, I want to put it back in the deck. So let's just say I've said that they've picked the 10 of clubs and I've done, hey, can you put the card back there? Now, if they say, I want to put the card back, then there's a couple of different options. The first option is, okay, no problem. Where do you want to put it? And you spread through the deck and they go to put it in there. And as soon as they go to put it in, I break the spread at that point and I go there. Okay, no problem, put it in. Uh, which is a Simon Lovell idea. I remember seeing Simon lecture on that when I was very early into magic. And I thought it was great. And his, his uh, opinion is, you know, if they're not going to put it back there in a nice squared pile, just spread through. And they, when they go to put it in, you just say, right there, okay, put it back there then for me. Uh, which achieves the same thing, but it feels like they've had a free choice of where to put it. Um, and that works a lot of the time. Um, another way of doing it is... If they really want to, you know, and sometimes that tends to work 99 times out of 100. But sometimes you'll break the spread and they'll go, no, I want to put it in. Get up the cards. And I'll go, OK, and I'll take the card off them. OK, uh, well, actually, I'm going to give you two different techniques here. I'll take the card off them. And what I'll do is I'll say, you take the deck and I'll put the card into the pack and you shuffle it. And as I take the card back, I just give it a little crimp there with my little finger. So I give it a little crimp there with my little finger. Boom. They then shuffle the cards to the best of their ability. They can do all of the shuffling that they want. And because of that crimp, I've now got, uh, I've got the exact position of where the card is. I can see it's right there. So I can cut and I've got the card on the bottom, right? So it's, it, if they insist on them putting the card back in the deck, you just go, okay, look, give me the card for a second. You take the deck, 
you put it into the pack wherever you want to. And I'll just take the card off them, give it to somebody else, and I'll put the crimp in at that point. Now, the other thing that you can do is you can just say, look, put the card back there. And then if they say, I want to put it somewhere else, you go, okay, no problem, no problem, no problem. You can shuffle the deck. How's that sound? And I'll, I'll do a convincing control so I can glimpse the card on the bottom. And then I'll give the card to cut and I'll say, you shuffle them. Because then I can come back and I can go, wow, you've given these a really good shuffle. And I can just get the card back to the top that way. Okay. So that's a few different ways that you can, you can, you can control the card, even if they're being funny about it. Right. Um, and it's all about knowing the situation and knowing what they're saying and when they're going to say and knowing what technique to work and what technique to use and so on and so forth. For any of those techniques should work for you. No problem. Okay. Okay, so the next question is from Sean Goff. How are you doing? Sean, hope you are well. Sean says, hey, Craig, great video. Thank you. Uh, my question for this week is, what is your self and Ryland's go-to tricks when handed a pack of cards? Uh, Ryland's go-to trick when handed a pack of cards is Back in Time by Jay Sankey. Um, that's the one where you do a slip clock shuffle and you end up with a double. You put the double on their hand and the deck sorts itself out and then the card turns into their card. He loves doing that. That's like his favorite trick in the whole world. Um, Back in Time by Jay Sankey. That's the one that he always does. Um, I'm trying to think of what the other... A lot of stuff that Ryland does uses Memdeck. Um, he also likes doing uh, Ambitious Card. He also likes doing Ambitious Card as well. But I suppose you'd need a pen for that. Uh, yeah, it's really Jay Sankey's Back in Time. That's the one that he tends to do. Uh, as for me, I do card in the box an awful lot. Uh, that's like my go-to trick, the one off the Penguin Live, uh, that card in the box. I absolutely love uh, that routine. It's kind of like my thousand timer. Um, but outside of that, I also very much like my handling of Triumph, which again is on the, uh, on the Penguin Live. Uh, and also uh, uh, something called Rising Triumph, which is on the Netrix. And I've got this oil and water routine that I perform all the time called Extreme Oil and Water, where the deck sorts itself out so they're all the right way. Uh, the deck sorts itself out. The shuffle deck sorts itself out into red and blacks, as well as the eight cards that you're doing that with. And that's also on the net tricks. Those are probably my go-tos. And Threesome by David Jonathan. Let me throw that into the mix. I love doing Threesome. Ryland loves doing Threesome as well. So there you go. Threesome and Back in Time for Ryland various different versions of Triumph and Card of the Box for me. So there you go. Hope that answers your questions. Okay, so the next question is from my favourite uh, YouTube commenter, the Drunk Magic Ukulele Player. Guten Tag, Craig. As well as magic, I have an interest in antique shows, so I've decided to apply for Bargain Hunt. My plan is to secretly carry a tampon in my pocket, sneak it onto a shelf, and say to the experts, look, I've found a nice period piece. Since the BBCs can be so far up their own arse, do you think it would be edited out for TV? It airs at 12.15pm. I will leave you this week for a joke I've just made up. Do you hear about the Magic Pirates? They had to mop the gaff deck. <laughs> Honestly, I think you're amazing. Um, I, you, you know what? I would, be, I, I, would, I would think of another thing to do uh, because I do think that at that time the BBC are not going to want anything risque at all. I don't think that's something that they're going to be very happy with. I'd try and come up with something equally amusing, uh, but less gross. But uh, love the joke. Thanks very much for your support. You the man. So the next question is from Alex Kilpatrick. And Alex says, how can we get the community at large to stop listening to people who say asinine things like this trick is terrible because it's not an instant reset? Not having an instant or even quick reset, not being a worker, uh, etc., are lazy and short-sighted sites. Those things don't make a trick inherently bad. They can only make the trick bad for certain contexts and situations. But those contexts in the grand scheme of things only apply to a relative few people. I'd be willing to bet if re re reliable data were available uh, to throw down a $50 bet that the vast majority of tricks performed on any day are performed once or maybe twice. And the vast majority of tricks purchased in any given month aren't purchased by professional working magicians. Yeah, I'd absolutely 100% agree with that, Alex. I completely agree with that. And one thing I used to do as a reviewer in the early days is I used to look negatively at any product that didn't fit my uh, kind of um, my view of what makes a working trick. So uh, it, it, if something didn't reset, 
then that would be an issue for me. Now, one thing I've tried to do since setting up Magic TV is look at things from every single aspect. And, you know, rather than making, uh, you know, saying that, giving a product a negative review because it hasn't got an instant reset, just highlighting it and saying, hey, this hasn't got an instant reset. That's something that you might want to be aware of. Um, you know, that would be an issue for me. It might not be an issue for you. Um, because you're right, different situations, different strokes for different folks, right? And um, the one thing that I get yeah, I've even tried to be more accepting to social media magic, especially as Ryland does a lot on Instagram now. And he doesn't do Instagram magic. He does magic that would work anywhere, but he does it on Instagram. Um, but, but I've even been more tolerant of, of social media magic. One thing I don't like, though, is if the ad copy says, hey, it can work at your next virtual gig, but it will work just as well in the real world. And it's obvious that it doesn't work in the real world. That's an issue for me. Or if a product doesn't have a very good tutorial and doesn't go into depth about how to do that trick properly that's an issue for me but I completely agree you know that's uh, I think you're referring to the review of my penguin live which we're not going to talk about anymore but uh, I know the reviewer talked about it wasn't you know amongst other things it wasn't practical you know the material wasn't practical you had to get different things and so on and so forth yeah it is what it is you know I, I, I wanted to put together a a, uh, a lecture on things that people normally find in their bottom drawer and how to present it in a completely different way and that was the goal of the lecture and I think I succeeded in that and I'm very proud of it and that's the most important thing so uh, yeah hopefully that helps Alex and I completely agree with your point 100% the next question is from Adrian Suter and Adrian says what's the difference between sun and moon and scotch and soda um good question so a sun and moon coin is typically a cut down copper silver coin with a shell that goes on top um so for example a um a, it might be a cut down english penny half dollar with a shell that goes on top that's a silver shell so when it's all nested together it looks like it's just a silver coin but you can unnest it and show a copper coin yeah that's what a sun and moon coin is um and you'll find typically that most hopping half sets have a sun and moon coin included in them right the key thing about a sun and moon coin is it's not locking. So that copper silver insert that goes into that silver shell will come out very, very easily just by, you know, displaying the shell or just by lifting up with your thumb. You can unnest the shell very, very easily. It doesn't lock. A scotch and soda um, is a locking. Uh, it, it's the same thing, basically. It's a copper silver coin that fits inside a shell but it locks in place. So once it's locked, it can't be unlocked. It can be examined, right? Um, and the only way to unlock it is either with a magnet if you're using like a coin unique style of coin or a bang ring if you're using a scotch and solder. Shoulder, sorry. Scotch and soda, sorry. Um, so a scotch and soda <clears throat> might be used, for example, to have the spectator hold their hand out and put a copper silver coin in their hand, get them to close their hand around the two coins, uh, they nest the coins together in their hand and they lock in place and you produce the copper coin and then they open up the hand and they've just got the silver, right? And they can examine both of the coins immediately. Uh, a, a sun and moon coin, uh, the quintessential routine was um, Solet Alun by Roger Klaus, but there's been lots of other variations over the years, including some routines that I've actually published myself as well. And it relies on sleight of hand and the ability to unnest that coin very, very easily and very, very quickly. So there you go, that's the, that's the difference. Hopefully that helps. So the next question is from Sam Fuller, magician. And Sam says, I'm the only one, am I the only one who tries to read what's on the whiteboard to see if I can see any sneak peeks of upcoming releases? You know, that whiteboard is used for different things on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, I normally forget to wipe the stuff off. And sometimes there's probably things on there that you guys shouldn't see. Uh, I think the last q and I did, uh, I'd been doing some training in the office uh, for new entertainers that had just joined Nonstop Kids Entertainment. So it was like all, I, I'd done a full day training. That, that room that I filmed the Q&A in when I'm in my office is actually our training room. So I was, uh, um, I was doing a full training day with two or three people. And I was, uh, that's all information on what they need to do in order to be a kid's entertainer. 
Uh, but other times it's been, we've had stuff on there that's like, you know, new tricks that are coming onto the net tricks. I have had lists of tricks that are going to be going on a particular project. Um, I have had, like, if I'm doing a sales meeting, if I'm doing a, uh, you know, I'll do regular meetings with the sales team and I'll be writing down stuff that they need to work on. That'll be in there. I, I tend to use that whiteboard a lot. So there is information on there that you guys probably shouldn't see. I should really get into the habit of wiping it off before I start, but I, I just always forget. Okay, so the final question today is from David Boy Smith. And David Boy Smith says, what's the best way to have a card rise from the deck with no sleight of hand? Okay, well, I talk about this an awful lot on the Netrix. There's like three or four routines, but I'll go into it very, very briefly for you if you uh, think it'll help. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a very easy, quick method to do this. Okay, so from a regular deck of cards, uh, just do a riffle and have somebody say stop. Now, there's more complicated ways of doing this, but this will be a really easy way for you. So have somebody uh, say stop. When they say stop, show them the face card of the right hand. Now, you're not doing a, a, a riffle force here, so they can stop anywhere they want to, but you want to time it so it's somewhere in the middle. Okay, so they say stop. You show them the face card of the right hand packet. Now, notice I'm holding the left hand packet so that the fingers are extended beyond the left edge, right? The reason for that is you're going to use those fingers to side jog this card that they're looking at. So they look at this card, and then the exposed view here is I put this packet onto this packet, side jog for half of its length so that my fingers here, my left hand fingers, touch the face of the right hand packet. And as I square that packet, as I square the packet up, the fingers keep this card side jog to the right. Okay, so you're here, you show them the card, two of spades in this case, and as I put it back, uh, that comes side jog. Now you don't see this because the right hand, I want you to notice that the right hand is holding the deck from above, thumb at the inner left, fingers covering the front, so that after I show them the card when they said stop, and I do this, um, they don't see anything. That card is now side job, but you don't see anything, right? Now what you're going to do is you're going to use these fingers to bevel the bottom cards over to the uh, over to the right. You're just going to literally put it into your hand and you're beveling those cards over, right? So they're being beveled like this. You actually got this card out jogged here behind the bevel. And all you're going to do is you're going to grip this packet, thumb here and forefinger here, and squeeze. Now what's happening is, as you can see here, that card is sticking out at an angle and the bevel is there as well. All you're gonna do now is get your little finger here like this, okay? So you're contacting this card, which is gonna allow you to push it up in a minute, all right? So uh, let's do this whole thing. So you say stop, stop, have a look at, why am I keep getting the two of spades? That's weird, right? Uh, <laughs> stops are four of hearts. So you square up and you say, fantastic, let me see if I can do this. And you get yourself into this position. Now, when you're in this position, it, it, there is a bevel, but it's not very big, right? But the card, don't know how well you can see that, the card is sticking out quite considerably. So I can use my little finger now to push that card up as I go up and down. The smaller motion of going up and down will hide, sorry, the bigger motion of going up and down will hide the smaller motion of my little finger pushing that card up like that. That's how you do an impromptu card rise. Um, so one more time. You're here, say stop, stop. This is the card, three of clubs. It goes back, you side jog the card. As I square up the deck, I've beveled. I come up like this, I square everything up. It looks like it's all squared up, but I've actually got control of that three of clubs. So now I can, uh, I can just have that card rise up out the back. And there it is, the, uh, the three of clubs risen out the deck. So hopefully that helps. Uh, there's a lot more information on various different ways of actually doing card rises on the Netrix. So don't want to make this a sales plug, but uh, that's worth checking out. www.thenetrix.com So there you go, guys. Thank you very much once again for joining us right here on Magic TV. I really appreciate it. Thank you for all the awesome questions. Uh, you want to see more videos like this, like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below. Don't forget, I'm going to be back again tomorrow um, at uh, 6 o'clock with a live, 2 o'clock with a short, 9 o'clock with a, another video, a 5 by 5 I believe. 
And uh, yeah, I'm going to be back again this evening uh, with a very special review show special. So look out for that. Uh, and there will be lots of videos coming up over the next week or two about Ryland and also about Magic Live. So look out for it. Thanks once again. I'll see you again soon. My name's Craig from Magic TV. <laughs>